proverb, I am because we are, is the foundation of the ACBN YouTube channel. Tap in for all of our remarkable content and ecosystem mobilization through the phenomenal practitioners and thought leaders we engage on this channel. In the words of Adrian Marie Brown, things are not getting worse, they are getting uncovered. We must hold each other tight to pull back the veil. Get ready for another amazing ACBN powered interview. Um, looking forward to this session. And now that we've got the ancestral and land acknowledgements out of the way, I want to introduce my remarkable panelists today. Um, so the SETC team has built some remarkable relationships over the past four years. It's been four years since our first annual conference. Um, my brother Isaac Olawalafe, who's speaking later today, reminded me um, with a beautiful picture um, that he sent me. So if you could check out our Instagram page, you'll see a picture from four years ago. I looked a lot younger and had less gray, beard, gray in my beard. Um, but the fact remains, it's been a remarkable journey um, in terms of the solidarity economy and really creating better outcomes or economic outcomes for Canadians. So I'm going to start um, with the introduction of my colleague, Jeff Sear. Jeff, I'm not going to read your bio because it's too intense, and I want to make sure that we can have the time. Um, so Jeff, would you like to introduce yourself to our colleagues here? Sure thing. So uh, I'll do it in, in our traditional way. So Tanchi, Ani, Bojo, Kinu, Kinu, Inene, Indigenous, Ottawa, Ndonj, Naba, Manitoba, Ndonj, Nabu. My name is Jeff Sear. My traditional name is Eagle Man Leading. My home territory is what we call the White Horse Plains or the Buffalo Hunt Staging Grounds of Southern Manitoba in the Red River Valley, sort of traditional home of the Métis Nation. Um, I live and work here in unceded Algonquin territory outside Ottawa, as I mentioned earlier. And I am the first and foremost, I'm a father of five and a proud husband. Um, secondly, I'm the uh, Chief Executive Officer of uh, Raven Indigenous Impact Foundation and co-founder and managing partner of Raven Indigenous Capital Partners. And if it's uh, if we want to get into that just a tiny bit, Raven is uh, an Indigenous owned and led financial intermediary. And we run now a couple of funds and a bunch of outcomes contracts around uh investing in indigenous enterprises and indigenous communities for better outcomes for so the upliftment of our people and mother earth uh so i'll just stop there we can get into more detail if you want later victor thank you so much jeff i appreciate you we're going to hand it off to our colleague jaleesa brown the executive director of tip hello everyone good morning it is great to see uh, all these wonderful faces <laughs> Uh, so nice to see everyone. Um, again, my name is Julissa Brown. I am the executive director at TIP, which stands for the Table of Impact Investment Practitioners. We are a table of community of practice for social finance fund managers, but also for folks that are interested in um, learning and getting into impact investment. So I'm definitely excited to, uh, you know, share a little bit more with you today. Thank you. Incredible. Give thanks for your leadership. We really appreciate you, Jaleesa. Um, we're going to move on to our colleague, Smitha Das. Thanks so much, Victor. It's great to be sharing space with all of you today. Um, I'm Smitha and Director of Impact and Mission Investing at World Education Services, or WES. We are a social enterprise that um, has been around for about 50 years, supporting newcomers, immigrants, refugees coming to the U.S. and Canada, providing credential evaluation services. And um, what I do is help invest our corporate philanthropy dollars and our endowment to further the mission. And so really excited to be here with you all. I've spent a career in impact investing in a few different um, hats like Jeff have experience in outcomes based financing when I was at social finance and have worked in um, particularly the private markets before that around um, climate investment. So happy to um, be here and, and share more. Incredible. Thank you so much. And Smith, you've been a remarkable colleague and partner of our work. So we just appreciate your leadership and diligence. We're going to hand it off to our colleague, Robin Wisner. Morning all, I'm uh, joining uh, similarly um, like Jeff from the NC, the territory of uh, the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. I'm a settler here and I just want to acknowledge that it's only because of their good stewardship um, of that land, that unacknowledged wisdom and good stewardship of that land, 
that it continues to sustain us and be a comfort to us. So I commit to honoring those ways, those people, and those land and their lands in my everyday activities. Um, for my position, my job, uh, the things I do um, in the realm of employed work. Um, I work for the Government of Canada. I work for Employment and Social Development Canada specifically. I work in um, the social innovation and social finance area and do my work as a policy analyst and special advisor to advance the social, innov social innovation and social finance strategy. Prior to that, I've spent time at, uh, in, um, at Immigration um, and Refugee Canada uh, in their social innovation area under the settlement program. And that's uh, basically the extent of my life in government. Prior to that, I've done a few other things, including um, economics, uh, high tech, um, uh, labor coaching, and, um, co and uh, uh, some consulting in uh, social policy, working with uh, vulnerable populations. So quite a weird journey. We're using the word journey, quite a strange journey to get me here, but uh, this is where I find uh, passion finds me and delighted to be here today. And thank you for your leadership and your great gift of wisdom, Victor, and to other panelists. Oh, we appreciate you so much, Robin. Thank you. And um, your work at ESDC and the work at IRP has been remarkable to so many ecosystems. So we give thanks for your leadership. We're going to hand it off to our colleague, Adam Spence from SVX. Many thanks, Victor. And, and thanks for the opportunity to join all of you here today in conversation. So I'm Adam with SVX, uh, calling in from Toronto, uh, Treaty 13 territory, uh, which is the ancestral territory of Mississauga's the New Credit, uh, Haudenosaunee, Huron, Wendat, and the Amishna Bay. Uh, so <clears throat> SGX as, as an organization or entity, we're, we're a nonprofit impact investing organization. We work with investors, funds, enterprises, um, and a whole host of ecosystem partners. And we do a few things uh, allowing folks to be able to take the first or next step on their impact investing journey from education, boot camps, workshops, uh, to advisory supports. Uh, we have a couple of funds, we have a platform, and then we do other systems change work. Uh, and we have the good fortune of working with our colleagues at, at SETSI um, here that are hosting on, on initiatives around place-based impact investing uh, and also do some work at, at a global level. So I've uh, been around, kind of kicking around uh, you know, the impact investing world for about 15 years in, in Canada um, and just really looking forward to the conversation today. So I'll pass it back. Yeah, we give thanks for your leadership, Adam, and it's been incredible working um, with your team through the Catalyst Community Finance Initiative, shameless plug. Um, but yeah, we give thanks for your leadership and your attendance and participation today. And last but not least, we're going to hand it off to our colleague, Brian Duarte from Black Tech Capital. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Brian Duarte from Black Tech Capital. We're a venture fund investing in Black and underrepresented founders in the clean tech space. Um, I've been in the energy industry a lot of my career, last 10 years, more focused on sustainability and clean tech and looking at you know people like myself in the difficulty as an entrepreneur and getting funding as a black founder wanted to really make a difference in that space um impacting there and then also for our planet and our climate so that would be me in a nutshell and glad to be here thanks victor thank you for your leadership and all the work that you're doing there are so many um founders that rely on the capital that your organization has deployed so we give thanks for your participation and your attendance. We're going to jump right into the questions. My first question is to you, Smitha. In your years of work in the impact investing ecosystem, what are some of the best practices that inspire you most? Sure, happy to kick it off. So, um, so I would say probably two two come to mind. One, um, in a previous life, I was doing like I was mentioning, um, really rigorous um, assessments of outcomes. And I think oftentimes when we talk about impact investing, there's a concern about what we're really meaning about impact. And particularly as we see larger pools of capital flowing into impact investing, not just in you know, impact first investments, if you think about that spectrum of capital, right, you have philanthropy impact first investments, you can have thematic investments, sustainable investing, which is like ESG integration, environmental social governance integration, and then 
responsible investing, which is really where a lot of this started many years ago around negative screens. So if you think about that spectrum of capital, there's an increasing of intentionality of impact as you get towards impact first investments. And so not to say necessarily increasing impact, but just increasing intentionality of impact, um, depending on, of course, how you measure impact on depth and breadth. So what I think is a really important trend is is really trying to define the impact and a lot of the work that I was doing before Wes was trying to measure those outcomes and tie financial return to outcomes. I'm sure Jeff can share some examples of how he's done that through the structure called a social impact bond. There's other structures out there that I was working on um, as well, but I think just having that rigor um, around measuring the outcomes is so important because I think what we've found over time is intentionality, while important, is not sufficient and um, good intentions can certainly do harm. So I think that's where having that rigor and, and how you measure outcomes and potentially tying that to return can really align incentives. And the second trend, if I, if I may, is uh, particularly in the work that I'm doing now, trying to unpack some of the power dynamics within investments. And so when you think about traditionally just the power dynamic, I'm thinking about, for example, in the venture world, where typically the biggest check has the biggest voice. And so how do we start thinking about why that's the case and really unpacking economic rights from voting rights and governance. And so what I'm trying to do right now at World, uh, World Education Services is really trying to think about not just shifting capital, but how do we shift power? And that often means um, really rethinking the role of Wes as an investor, as more of a facilitator of capital than, say, a deployer of capital. And so we're really thinking about different structures internally through our own governance processes in the types of organizations we want to support in their organizational design, as well as the actual process, trying to think about participatory investing processes, which I'm happy to talk about more um, as we continue. So those are you know, two very different trends, but I think very important and where I believe the field you know, really should be going. I love that, Seth. Thank you so much for all those actual insights and your leadership and brilliance as always, Smitha. Um, and that's a perfect segue to my colleague, Jeff. You use the word outcome. And the reason why I bring up Jeff is because, well, one, this is um, in the spirits of what we call Ubuntu, I am because we are, and Yahoo, freedom. One of the sentiments that was shared yesterday was the relationship between Black and Indigenous communities. And Black folks will never actually have sovereignty until there's land back rights for Indigenous peoples in Canada. And folks were talking about the scene of the crime on the land access and food sovereignty panel. So when I hear the word outcome, I think about the remarkable work that's being done at Raven around outcomes-based financing. Jeff, would you love to share some of this with us? Because I know we're doing our beyond solidarity work and trying to connect our communities, but I'd love to hear more about the work you're doing around outcomes-based financing. Sure, uh, and I appreciate the opportunity to share. Uh, so let's hope I'm cogent on a Saturday morning about this. Second thing I want to say is, I would really love to hire Smitha one day. Anyway, it's just awesome hearing you speak, Smitha, and your experience. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, uh, as I think a lot of the panelists know, Raven got into this world uh, looking at closing sort of equity and capital and really starting with Indigenous venture capital. And that's great because it invests in Indigenous enterprises and, create, and it creates impact. But on the other side, we also started to, to engage at the community level and recognize that there's community level capital gaps and, and I would say power relation problems, process problems, a whole bunch of problems that existed in indigenous communities for the last couple of hundred years forced by colonization and the nature of the way that we've constructed economies in the Western world to get super theoretical on a Saturday morning. Um, so what we ended up doing is partnering with a bunch of indigenous communities, indigenous social enterprises on the ground and saying, can we rethink how complex problems are solved in the community? And um, you, usually that has been a process of top down uh, where the capital, the money, in this case, a lot of time government money is driving how problems are solved. Um, and our working theory is that those closest to the problem know how to solve it. They just need the right tools to do it. And most of the time, those tools revolve around capital showing up in the right way. 
Um, and in working, you know, the, the process we use called the community driven outcomes contract um, is, you know, very simply titled that way on purpose because we, we want to, the whole point is to center the community and the creation of problem solving. And when you do that, you set the outcomes that you want to achieve in front of investing, not after the investing. And impact investing, uh, which I love, of course, we're impact investors, but it also has a tendency to try to measure outcomes after the fact. I think one of the trends is that intentionality is starting has been starting to pivot over the last six or seven years, seems to start pivoting over the last six or seven years. Um, but in terms of rethinking and reworking relationships with the state and how issues are addressed, a community-centered outcomes-driven approach um, seems to make both natural sense um, in terms of how you would solve a problem and center and build community resiliency and capacity. I mean, and maybe this is a lot of words on Saturday morning uh, to throw at people and I apologize for that. Um, but so, you know, we, you know, as a, on our charitable side, on our foundation side, we do the design and construction and really all the engagement work. And I would say it's a long lead ramp on these. These are not like doing a venture capital investment. It's hard work in community unpacking all the levers. And to be honest, a lot of the assets and strengths that are already there, building on the knowledge of elders, building on what community knows what to do and how to do it and structuring it. And only after that do we go and look for capital and what structure it needs to come in over what period of time. Um, and so, you know, I guess the point is, and maybe it's not revolutionary, but it feels good when you're doing it is uh, we don't want the capital to drive the way the problems are solved or addressed. Uh, we want the community need to drive the way the problem is solved. Um, what's uh, a couple of brief comments on that is one is what I found over the last sort of year and a half to two years in doing uh, deeper outcomes work is the, in the impact investing space seems deeply interested in doing this. And I think for probably some of the things you highlighted, Victor and Smitha highlighted uh, in terms of uh, getting better outcomes on their investments and being able to measure those outcomes because an outcomes driven approach starts with what you're going to measure right at the right at the outset right which makes it more valuable but also sort of time consuming um, and of late it seems that the the outcomes purchasers which is generally different orders of government uh, also seem interested in finding a way to achieve better outcomes uh, in that way and we work specifically in climate and health um, because we think those two areas are interconnected uh, and we're concerned about Mother Earth and the health of our people, and we think that's where we can have the biggest impact. Uh, not that there's not a whole bunch of other areas that need work. So that's a lot. Sorry about that. I'm going to pause and then turn it back to you, Victor. No, don't apologize at all, my friend, my brother. Um, you have no idea how important capacity building is. And folks are really understanding and being to lean in on these models that definitely are revolutionary. Um, and you, you mentioned elders. One of our panels yesterday was called When Elders Speak. And it was a remarkable demonstration of intergenerational collaboration in the Jaden Finch community to have all these elders and stalwarts share their actionable insights over decades of work. So when you share um, what you just shared around the outcomes, um, basically shaping and framing the model in the capital, not shaping the model, but it's community shaping it. I think it makes a lot of sense. And it's a segue to our next colleague, Jaleesa Brown, um, the first Black Executive Director of the Table for Impact Investment Practitioners. Hopefully soon I'll stop saying first. Um, but the fact remains, Jaleesa, in terms of intergenerational collaboration and the work that you've been doing over the past few weeks, like you've met with the National Advisory Board of Bikino Fasu, the National Advisory Board of Spain, Colombia, um, Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe, Zambia, I think we mean with South Africa. And right now, Canada has the mandate from the Global Steering Group to build out its own national advisory board between CAFID, which handles all things impact investing internationally, and TIP, all things nationally. How has that journey been for you thus far? And what are some of the trends um, or systemic barriers that you're seeing in the ecosystem?